I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I'm very grateful today for this opportunity. I'm more than grateful, uncharacteristically nervous. I'm genuinely humbled and supremely honored for the opportunity to be back in your presence to see familiar faces and then to see not familiar faces. I recognize that this is a very stressful time of year for both professor and student, and I believe that's where my anxiety is coming from. I'm having flashbacks. Uh, I just realized that when I stood up that it's, it's a, general, uh, a general sense of tension that comes upon me during this time of year because I feel like there's a paper that's due and I can't, I keep having these recurring dreams that I'm late for class and all those types of things. So it probably was not a good thing for me to be here today, but on second thought, I am very grateful to be in your presence so that I can share my convictions, particularly as it relates to this issue of passing the ministry from one generation to the next. Specifically today, however, and perhaps even on Thursday, I want to talk about ministry fundamentals. Ministry fundamentals. Because it's my conviction that when the fundamentals of any area are mastered, there's no limit to what the Holy Spirit can do through human personality. And so if you want to be a great basketball player, uh, it's not about slam dunks, it's really about uh, passing, it's really about playing defense, it's really about free throws. If you want to be a great cook, great chef, you must know the difference between boiling and broiling. Uh, you, you have to master the fundamentals, and there are certain fundamental uh, concepts, fundamental disciplines, fundamental ideas in ministry that if we're going to experience fruitfulness and faithfulness in ministry over the long haul, we simply must master. And so here this aged preacher, Paul, is talking to his young protege through the medium of a letter. He has left Timothy at Ephesus. He wants to get there, but he he writes saying, just in case I don't make it to Ephesus, I want you to understand how God's family, how the household of God ought to operate. And so in this uh, pericope, this paragraph, this passage of scripture, he points out some things about ministry that I think are useful for us today. I know they're useful for us today because we live in an age where somehow or another we have tried to divorce those things that God meant to be married forever, like ministerial proficiency and moral propriety, like doctrinal, doctrinal integrity and emotional intelligence, like private devotion and being a public example. And so Paul uh, revisits uh, these items, these issues, in this uh, paragraph, you will remember the last time our man Paul was in Ephesus. He warned the elders there in Acts chapter 20, around verse 28 through 31, that uh, when he left, there was going to be an infiltration of the church. Uh, there would be false teachers who would try to infiltrate, and then they there would be individuals from within the church that would try to ri raise up uh, disciples after them. And so he warned them in Acts chapter 20 to be on guard for themselves as well as the flock. So here in this letter to Timothy in this fourth chapter after having in the previous uh, chapters talked talk about uh, what he wanted men to do in terms of leading out in prayer and the role of women in ministry and then the, the character traits that ought to be resident in those who would lead the family of God, he points out in chapter four that there's gonna come a time when people will be distracted by demonic doctrines, uh, doctrines that will mess with what God called good, namely marriage. And uh, anybody been paying attention? Can I get a side note here? You said I could preach like I would if I were at home. 
so I'm not going to run this rabbit trail. I'm just going to throw a rock down the rabbit trail, hope to hit the rabbit, and I'll get back on track. Isn't it strange if you've been watching the protests going on all across the country as it relates to Proposition 8 in California, how people are wanting to mess with what God has already called good? The Apostle Paul prophesied that those days were coming and they're here right now where men will want to uh, distort and pervert uh, that which God has set up, namely marriage and even uh, his creation as it relates to foods and abstaining from certain foods, uh, uh, trying to provide some type of outward show of religion that really has no power to transform. And so... Uh, we, we pick up in verse 6, and I really only want to say one thing, but it's going to take me about 20 minutes to get down to it. So I hope you can stay awake. If you can't, uh, I deputize the person sitting next to you to poke you in the ribs when they see you uh, drowsing off. But in verse 6, he talks about being a good minister, or uh, that word good could be translated beautiful. It could be translated excellent. If you want to be excellent in ministry, and, and more so down in verse 15, he talks about uh, the, the idea that you ought to show progress in ministry. Can, can I say this as I frame our discussion, that it's impossible to be perfect in ministry, but you ought to be progressing. There ought to be some uh, ostensible advancement. There ought to be some quantifiable uh, mat maturation uh, taking place as you uh, go further in your journey with the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, if you want to be excellent in ministry, if you want your progress to be evident to all, there are certain fundamental things that you just have to uh, keep revisiting, the fundamental things that you have to keep mastering. Uh, I have a, uh, a first degree black belt in Taekwondo. Don't worry, I'm not that good. Uh, but I have gone through the process and uh, my uh, my instructor, uh, every time I would see him, he would talk about control your distance, you know, keep your hands up, breathe. Uh, there are certain fundamental things you have to do in martial arts that allow you, if you master them, to do the more complex things. Let me put it to you this way. There was a movie probably two decades ago now called The Karate Kid. Uh, and in uh, that movie, uh, the, the, uh, Mr. Miyagi, uh, would uh, inculcate, he would drill into his young ward the fact that you had to learn how to breathe. You, you had to maintain your balance. And even when uh, the uh, karate kid got messed up one time in a tournament uh, and it looked like he wasn't going to be able to proceed, uh, he asked Mr. Miyagi, can you help me out? And Mr. Miyagi uh, rubbed his hands together and put him back together and allowed him to continue the fight, but he was only able to do so because he had mastered the fundamentals. Well, what are some fundamental things that we must master as it relates to ministry? You see it there in your text. He says in verse six uh, that we have to be constantly nourished. Constantly nourished. Is that what your Bible says? Maybe mine is broke, let's see. Constantly nourished on the words of faith and on the sound doctrine which you have been following. Yeah, that's what it says. Constantly nourished. In other words, you have to have a healthy diet. Isn't it strange that we live in a society that is overfed and undernourished? And what's true, physically speaking, is even more true, spiritually speaking. We've allowed ourselves in this Facebook, this Twitter, this internet uh, society to be bombarded with information, but we're being overfed and undernourished because we're not feeding on the truth, the truth that, that can be found in the word of God. He said, listen, uh, my, my protege, my young brother, you have to make sure you monitor your diet, make sure you're eating right, and make sure you're eating regularly. Uh, there was a time when I used to suffer from uh, tremendous sinus problems, particularly around this time of year, and I went uh, to various doctors. One doctor had me just on a, a uh, regimen of taking shots every uh, week or so. But I got tired of taking shots. I went to another doctor, and they prescribed something else. Finally, I 
I went to the doctor that I have now and who I love uh, very much. And what he did was he changed my diet. He said, listen, you're allergic to some things that are in the air and you can't fight the air. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change your diet so you'll be built up on the inside. And if you keep doing what I tell you to do, you'll be nourished enough on the inside that you'll be able to fight off the stuff on the outside. Paul is saying here that if you want to be excellent in ministry, if you want your progress to be observable to all, you have to make sure that you're constantly being nourished in the word of God constantly in your daily devotion, in your Bible study, uh, that you're uh, finding time, even in days like this, and trust me, I remember, but you have to find time, even in seasons like this, to nourish yourself before you try to find uh, the answers to nourish somebody else. In other words, you got to eat right. You got to eat right. But not only eating, he goes on to talk about exercising. Because if you want to be healthy, you just can't have intake. you got to put it to work. He says in uh, verse uh, 8 that bodily discipline, and verse 7, pardon me, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, for bodily discipline is of a little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. He says, listen, you, you got to make sure can I say it this way? That you're getting enough fiber in your diet, healthy doctrine. Stay away from the junk food, uh, that is, old fables and uh, godless chatter, uh, old wives' tales. He said, but at some point, you got to make sure that you're disciplining yourself for godliness. Because just like your physical body needs exercise, your spirit man needs exercise. When you learn the principles of God, when you learn the doctrines of our faith, you have to put them into practice. Isn't it strange that we have evangelicals that don't evangelize? If I was at my church, an amen would go right there. <laughs> See, it's not enough just to get the doctrine right. You have to put doctrine into duty. You have to put feet to your faith. So he says... We need to exercise ourselves in godliness. We need to employ the disciplines uh, of our faith, whether we're talking about uh, not just Bible study, but meditation, uh, fasting, and prayer, uh, whether we're talking about uh, the, the, the discipline of silence. Uh, whatever it might be, he says there are, uh, there are various workstations in the gymnasium of godliness, and you need to make sure you're making the full circuit so that you won't be, and I know some of you cannot relate to this, but I have cousins who've been in jail, been in prison, uh, and one, there's a way that you can tell when somebody's been in jail for a long time, been in prison for a long time, they'll get what they call a prison build. What that means is they're real buffed up top, but then if you look at their legs, look like olive oil <laughs> of Popeye fame, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, the idea is, uh, in prison, they, 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 they concentrate on one thing to the neglect of something else. If you're going to be healthy, you need to work out your entire frame. And the Bible says that we must exercise ourselves in godliness because that holds promise not just for our daily activity today, but it will carry weight even into eternity because the goal of the disciplines is not just an outward show of propriety, but the inward character development that will carry more weight than even your gifts. Let me say that differently. That if you want to make an impact in ministry, it's not just about your gifts. It has to be about your character. Because character ultimately will carry more weight than gift. I believe I'm accurate because I think the Bible says something to the effect that if I could speak with the tongue of men and of angels, that's gift, but have not love, that's character, it's nothing. He goes on to argue in this text to young Timothy that you need to command, uh, you need to teach these things constantly so that no one will look down upon your youth, but by giving a godly example, 
by giving a godly example, uh, that word example there, typos in the, in the Greek, uh, a pattern, uh, a, a something that someone else can emulate to their benefit. Just like uh, in kindergarten classes all over uh, the country, there uh, tends to be things on the wall that give the kindergartners an example of how you make an A, how you make a B, how you make a C, how you draw your numbers. Paul says here that if you're going to excel in ministry, you got to recognize that people are following you. So your personal devotion, as well as your public example, does make a difference. And you need to make sure that you're being an example that people can follow accurately, particularly, particularly as it relates to your speech, your conduct, your love, your faith, and purity. And he goes on to argue in verse 13. He says, now, until I get there, I want you to concentrate on the ministry of the word. Notice what he says, the public reading of scripture, exhortation or preaching, and then teaching. Uh, the, we, we've lost something in this age where some people are using technology as a crutch and not recognizing that the very nature of our proclamation and the very nature of scripture is oral. These letters were written, were meant to be read out loud. And, and, and there's, there's an oral component to the proclamation of God's word that we can never discount. And even though we, uh, by God's grace, try to use technology to augment, it should never substitute the fact that there is a place for the public reading of scripture in worship. And since that is true, we ought to find ourselves practicing the public reading of scripture. That's another discipline that will help you in your prayer life as well as in your meditation. Uh, that is, when you're by yourself, reading scripture out loud because there's something that happens. There's something in the physiology of uh, orally, of verbally expressing scripture. Uh, it hits you a different way than when you just try to uh, read it in your head. He says here, don't neglect that. The public reading of scripture, exhortation and teaching, literally he's letting us know that even though you have gifts and I want you to exercise those gifts, I want you to remember that your gifts have been affirmed. Obviously, Timothy was somewhat of a, a timid leader and Paul uh, found ways to reaffirm him. He said, listen, I want you to concentrate on the main thing. And the main thing is the ministry of the word. That's the, that's the only thing that God has left us with to transform this society, to transform this world. It will not be done by mere political power. It will not be done uh, by social action. It will be done by this hammer, by this fire, by this sword called the word of God. And since that is so, we need to find ourselves obsessed with the ministry of the word of God. That's why you're here. That's why you're studying. That's why that paper makes a difference. That's why you're going to class. You're sharpening your tools so that you can be used by God in his redemptive enterprise in this world. And that enterprise is primarily being carried out by the ministry of the word. So that's why he says in verse 15 that you need to take pains, that you need to, uh, you need to, Absorb yourself in this. You need to literally, this is Copeland's translation, you need to marinate yourself in this so that when you bleed, you bleed Bibline. So that when you burp, you burp Bibline. So that there's an aroma of the word of God and the truth of scripture that emanates in your conduct, in your speech, and in everything that you do. That cannot be manufactured. That only comes as you allow yourself to soak in the word, to soak in his presence. And yes, even in uh, difficult times where uh, there are time pressures, you, you got to find a way to fight to get in the presence of God and spend some time alone being silent so that his word can transform you 
transform you as your mind is renewed by listening to what God has said. He says, if you do all of this, your progress will be evident to all. Everyone will see that you are maturing in the faith. And finally, I get to this one last little verse, and I'm, I'm done, that I was trying to get to all along. We finally made it. Verse 16, he says, take heed unto yourself. Pay close attention to yourself and to the doctrine. Isn't it strange that he would put it in that order? He says, you need to exegete you. You need to know the, the lay of the land of your soul. You need to know the landscape of your soul so that by the word of God, uh, you can cooperate with the Holy Spirit in your Bible study, in your meditation, in your disciplines, so that in the landscape of your soul, every valley can be exalted. Every mountain can be brought low. Every crooked place made straight and every rough place made smooth. He says, pay attention to you. In other words, uh, I don't know about you, but if I could just get me in a headlock, <laughs> if, if I could just get a good grip on me, uh, Paul uh, reminds us, he says, that uh, the enemy in you is the one that you have to watch the most. Because uh, when we talk about the lust of the flesh, the lust of, of the eyes, the pride of life, isn't it so that these things reside in us and all the devil can do is present opportunities? So he says here, watch yourself. Pay close attention to yourself. It, I told you it's not either or. It's, it's both and, is it not? It, is, is this not doctrinal integrity and personal purity? Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for by doing so, you shall both save yourself and them that hear you. And so Paul finally comes down and gets us to the bottom line. Why is this so important? Why is this in the Bible? Why is it so important that we nourish ourselves, that we exercise, that we make sure that we're leaving a pattern so that if people follow us, they're moving toward God and not away from him. Why is it so important that we, uh, we close the achievement gap between what we say and what we do? Why is that so important? Because Paul says there's so much at stake. He says in verse 16, if you do these things, if you follow my admonitions and practice what is true, practice what is true and preach what is true. If you follow my admonitions and become proficient in ministry and pure in your morality, if you practice what I'm telling you, and that is make the ministry of the word your prime obsession, he says you'll both save yourself and those who hear you. Now, obviously, he's not talking about salvation in, in terms of justification, but I believe what's at stake here is what he's been arguing in the whole letter and what he had warned the Ephesian church about back in Acts chapter 20. Remember, he said, take heed, back in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, take heed, because when I leave, there's going to be people who are going to try to infiltrate the church and uh, with their uh, false doctrine, they're going to lead many astray. In this same letter, uh, 1 Timothy, back in chapter 1, he talks about the fact that some have fallen away. And in uh, chapter 1, verse 19, he talks about some have shipwrecked their faith. So what's at stake in these ministry fundamentals, what's at stake in mastering these disciplines is the fact that if you don't, there's the possibility that you might fall away, you might lead others astray, you might shipwreck your faith. One of the tragedies of modern transportation past few years is they've uh, found out that there's a significant number of pilots who show up to work inebriated. Now here's the problem with a drunk pilot. 
if the pilot goes down, the whole ship is in trouble. My brothers and sisters, what's at stake here is not just your personal ministry, not just your reputation. What's at stake here is that some of you are going to be, if not already, pilots. And pilots cannot afford to be drunk or distracted. My mother, earlier this year, was in the hospital for about four days. She was deathly ill. We did not think she was going to make it. My mother has been a licensed practical nurse. She's retired now. She was a licensed pract practical nurse for over 30 years. She knows a lot about health and medicine. But she wound up in the hospital because there was a new pharmacist at the place where she gets her prescription filled. And this inexperienced, inept pharmacist put the wrong medicine in her prescription. It said one thing on the cover, but it was something else on the inside. And she took it and almost died. What's at stake with us getting this right? We have the cure for this world. That's what we say. We got to make sure that what we say on the outside is truly what we're prescribing to people because poison can kill quicker than starvation. Drunk pilots, inept pharmacists, lazy ministers. What's the difference? Well, if a pilot goes down, he'll take two, three, four hundred with him. Pharmacist makes a mistake, somebody's gonna wind up in the hospital. If we don't take our calling serious, there can be untold damage for generations. If you don't believe me, look back at history about 30 years ago, around this time, itinerant Pentecostal preacher in San Francisco was gathering people up off Skid Row, preaching a poison doctrine, exercising such influence over them that he was able to convince almost a thousand people to move to Guyana. And 30 years ago, because of the prescription that he gave them, where 900 people died, 303 of them children, because Jim Jones was giving out bad medicine. I want to challenge you, even as you work on that paper, even as you go to your language classes, even as you study what you perceive to be dry theology, to recognize that you got to get the fundamentals right. Because if you don't get it right, it's not just you who's going to be affected. You can affect generations, but now if you get it right, if you get the story right, if you can accurately articulate that old, old story that God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That if any man be in Christ, he'd be a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be rescued, delivered, saved. If you get it right, Untold generations will be blessed because you weren't drunk at the wheel.
because you got the prescription right. With every head bowed, every eye closed. Father God, we bow in your presence acknowledging that we're unworthy to be partners with you in ministry, but we're grateful that you've chosen us. Please forgive us for our lackadaisical attitude toward exercising ourselves in godliness. Help us to filter out all the things that are feeding us but not nourishing us. Help us to examine ourselves in the light of your word and to adjust ourselves appropriately in the mirror of truth. And help us to be not just hearers, but doers of your word. Now I pray for these students, I pray for these professors and these administrators, and everyone here who is trying to promote the cause of the kingdom and everyone here who is trying to sharpen their tools so that they can be a more fit vessel for your use. Lord, I pray that you would give them grace and that even in the disciplines, the, the disciplines of prayer and fasting, and Bible study, Bible reading, memorizing scripture, and all the other journaling, all the other disciplines, dear Lord, I pray that you would meet them, that you would transform them, that you would renew them in the spirit of their minds as they earnestly search for you so that they can be good ministers, constantly nourished on the words of faith. This is your servant's prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to challenge you as you go forward today to rethink why you came here. God has a calling on your life, and you're not here by accident. He's given you godly models, but now you need to be a godly model as well. So there might be some adjustments you need to make in how you use your discretionary time. Might be some adjustments you need to make in how you organize your day. But whatever you do, I want to challenge you to remember that God has placed you in a unique position to be a blessing to somebody else, and you need to take that seriously because it's not just doctrinal integrity. It has to be personal purity. It's, just, it's not just ministerial proficiency, getting the tools, but it's about moral propriety, living your life in the light of eternity. So go forward today uh, with this assurance that if you constantly nourish yourself, you will be a good minister. And if you continue to progress, even if you're not perfect, you'll still get that commendation at the end of the day. Well done, good and faithful servant. Can I give you the benediction now? Can we all stand? This is supposed to be like at my church, right? Grab somebody by the hand. with every head bowed. Now unto him who's able to keep you from falling and able to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Encourage somebody before you go.